Chapter 14. Wargrave, Waxworks, Sunning, Our Stew, Montmorency is Sarcastic, Fight between Montmorency and the Tea Kettle, George's Banjo Studies, Meet with Discouragement, Difficulties in the Way of the Musical Amateur, Learning to Play the Bagpipes, Harris Feels Sad After Supper, George and I Go for a Walk, Return Hungry and Wet, There is a Strangeness About Harris, Harris and the Swans, A Remarkable Story, Harris Has a Troubled Night. We caught a breeze after lunch, which took us gently up past Wargrave and Ship Lake. Mellowed in the drowsy sunlight of a summer's afternoon, Wargrave, nestling where the river bends, makes a sweet old picture as you pass it, and one that lingers long upon the retina of memory. The Georgian Dragon at Wargrave boasts a sign painted on the one side by Leslie R.A., and on the other by Hodgson of that ilk. Leslie has depicted the fight, Hodgson has imagined the scene after the fight. George, the work done, enjoying his pint of beer. Day, the author of Sanford and Merton, lived and, more credit to the place still, was killed at Wargrave. In the church is a memorial to Mrs. Sarah Hill, who bequeathed and pound one annually to be divided at Easter between two boys and two girls who, quote, have never been undutiful to their parents, who have never been known to swear or to tell untruths, to steal or to break windows. Fancy giving up all that for five shillings a year. It is not worth it. It is rumored in the town that once, many years ago, a boy appeared who really ha never had done these things, or at all events, which is which was all that was required or could be expected, had never been known to do them, and thus won the crown of glory. He was exhibited for three weeks afterwards in the town hall under a glass case. What has become of the money since, no one knows. They say it is always handed over to the nearest waxworks show. Ship Lake is a pretty village, but it cannot be seen from the river being upon the hill. Tennyson was married in Ship Lake Church. The river up to Sonning winds, winds in and out through many islands and is very placid, hushed, and lonely. Few folk, except at twilight, a pair or two of rustic lovers, walk along its banks. Airy and Lord Fitznoodle have been left behind at Henley, and dismal dirty Redding is not yet reached. It is a part of the river in which to dream of bygone days and vanished forms and faces and things that might have been but are not confound them. We got out at Sunning and went for a walk round the village. It is the most fairy-like little nook on the whole river. It is more like a stage village than one built of bricks and mortar. Every house is smothered in roses and now in early June they were bursting forth in clouds of dainty splendor. If you stop at Sunning, put up at the bull behind the church. It is a veritable picture of an old country inn with green square courtyard in front where, on seats beneath the trees, the old men group of an evening to drink their ale and gossip over village politics with low quaint rooms and lattice windows and awkward stairs and winding passages. We roamed about Sweet Sunning for an hour or so, and then, it being too late to push on past Reading, we decided to go back to one of the Ship Lake Islands and put up there for the night. It was still early when we got settled, and George said that, as we had plenty of time, it would be a splendid opportunity to try a good slap-up supper. He said he would show us what could be done up the river in the way of cooking, and suggested that, with the vegetables and the remains of the cold beef and general odds and ends, we should make an Irish stew. It seemed a fascinating idea. George gathered wood and made a fire, and Harris and I started to peel the potatoes. I should never have thought that peeling potatoes was such an undertaking. The job turned out to be the biggest thing of its kind that I had ever been in. We began cheerfully, one might almost say skittishly, but our lightheartedness was gone by the time the first potato was finished. The more we peeled, the more peel there seemed to be left on. By the time we had got all the peel off and all the eyes out, there was no potato left, at least none worth speaking of. George came and had a look at it. It was about the size of a peanut. He said, oh, that won't do. You're wasting them. You must scrape them. So we scraped them, and that was harder work than peeling. They are such an extraordinary shape, potatoes, all bumps and warts and hollows. 
We worked steadily for five and twenty minutes and did four potatoes. Then we struck. We said we should require the rest of the evening for scraping ourselves. I never saw such a thing as potato scraping for making a fellow in a mess. It seemed difficult to believe that the potato scrapings in which Harris and I stood, half smothered, could have come off four potatoes. It shows you what can be done with economy and care. George said it was absurd to have only four potatoes in an Irish stew, so we washed half a dozen or so more and put them in without peeling. We also put in a cabbage and about half a peck of peas. George stirred, stirred it all up, and then he said that there seemed to be a lot of room to spare. So we overhauled both the hampers and picked out all the odds and ends and the remnants and added them to the stew. There were half a pork pie and a bit of cold boiled bacon left, and we put them in. Then George found half a tin of potted salmon, and he emptied that into the pot. He said that was the advantage of Irish stew. You got rid of such a lot of things. I fished out a couple eggs that had got cracked and we put those in. George said they would thicken the gravy. I forgot the other ingredients, but I know nothing was wasted. And I remember that, towards the end, Montmorency, who had evinced great interest in the proceedings throughout, strolled away with an earnest and thoughtful air reappearing a few minutes afterwards with a dead water rat in his mouth, which he evidently wished to present as his contribution to the dinner, whether in a sarcastic spirit or with a genuine de desire to assist, I cannot say. We had a discussion as to whether the rat should go in or not. Harris said that he thought it would be all right, mixed up with the other things, and that every little helped. But George stood up for precedent. He said he had never heard of water rats in Irish stew, and he would rather be on the safe side and not try experiments. Harris said, If you never try a new thing, how can you tell what it's like? It's men such as you that hamper the world's progress. Think of the man who first tried German sausage. It was a great success, that Irish stew. I don't think I ever enjoyed a meal more. There was something so fresh and piquant about it. One's palate gets so tired of the old hackneyed things. Here was a dish with a new flavor, with a taste like nothing else on earth. And it was nourishing, too. As George said, there was good stuff in it. The peas and potatoes might have been a bit softer, but we all had good teeth, so that, that did not matter much. And as for the gravy, it was a poem, a little too rich, perhaps, for a weak stomach, but nutritious. We finished up with tea and cherry tart. Montmorency had a fight with the kettle during tea time and came off a poor second. Throughout the trip, he had manifested great curiosity concerning the kettle. He would sit and watch it as it boiled with a puzzled expression and would try and rouse it every now and then by growling at it. When it began to sputter and stream, steam, he regarded it as a challenge and would want to fight it, only at that precise moment someone would always dash up and bear off his prey before he could get at it. Today he determined he would be beforehand. At the first sound the kettle made, he rose, growling, and advanced towards it in a threatening attitude. It was only a little kettle, but it was full of pluck, and it would up and spit at him. Ah! Would ye! growled Montmorency, showing his teeth. I'll teach you to cheek a hard-working, respectable dog, ye miserable, long-nosed, dirty-looking scoundrel, ye. Come on! And he rushed at that poor little kettle and seized it by the spout. Then across the evening stillness broke a blood-curdling yelp. And Montmorency left the boat and did a constitutional three times round the island at the rate of 35 miles an hour, stopping every now and then to bury his nose in a bit of cool mud. From that day, Montmorency regarded the kettle with a mixture of awe, suspicion, and hate. Whenever he saw it, he would growl and back at a rapid rate with his tail shut down. And the moment it was put upon the stove, he would promptly climb out of the boat and sit on the bank till the whole tea business was over. George got out his banjo after supper and wanted to play it, but Harris objected. He said he had got a headache and did not feel strong enough to stand it. George thought the music might do him good, said music often soothed the nerves and took away a headache, and he twanged two or three notes just to show Harris what it was like. Harris said he would rather have the headache. George has never learned to play the banjo to this day. He has had 
too much all-round discouragement to meet. He tried on two or three evenings while we were up the river to get a little practice, but it was never a success. Harris's language used to be enough to unnerve any man, added to which Montmorency would sit and howl steadily right through the performance. It was not giving the man a fair chance. What's he want to howl like that for when I'm playing? George would exclaim indignantly while taking aim at him with a boot. What do you want to play like that for when he is howling? Harris would retort, catching the boot. You let him alone. He can't help howling. He's got a musical ear and your playing makes him howl. So George determined to postpone study of the banjo until he reached home. But he did not get much opportunity even there. Mrs. P. used to come up and say she was very sorry. For herself, she liked to hear him. But the lady upstairs was in a very delicate state, and the doctor was afraid it might injure the child. Then George tried taking it out with him late at night and practicing round the square. But the inhabitants complained to the police about it, and a watch was set for him one night, and he was captured. The evidence against him was very clear, and he was bound over to keep the peace for six months. He seemed to lose heart in the business after that. He did make one or two feeble efforts to take up the work again when the six months had elapsed, but there was always the same coldness, the same want of sympathy on the part of the world to fight against, and after a while he despaired altogether and advertised the instrument for sale at a great sacrifice, quote, owner having no further use for same, and took to learning card tricks instead. It must be disheartening work learning a musical instrument, you would think that society, for its own sake, would do all it could to assist a man to acquire the art of playing a musical instrument, but it doesn't. I knew a young fellow once who was studying to play the bagpipes, and you would be surprised at the amount of opposition he had to contend with. Why, not even from the members of his own family did he receive what you could call active encouragement. His father was dead against the business from the beginning and spoke quite unfeelingly on the subject. My friend used to get up early in the morning to practice, but he had to give up that plan because of his sister. She was somewhat religiously inclined, and she said it seemed such an awful thing to begin the day like that. So he sat up at night instead and played after the family had gone to bed, but that did not do, as it got the house such a bad name. People going home late would stop outside to listen, and then put it about all over the town the next morning that a fearful murder had been committed at Mr. Jefferson's the night before, and would describe how they had heard the victim's shrieks and the brutal oaths and curses of the murderer, followed by the prayer for mercy and the last dying gurgle of the corpse. So they let him practice in the daytime in the back kitchen with all the doors shut, but his more successful passages could generally be heard in the sitting room in spite of these precautions and would affect his mother almost to tears. She said it put her in mind of her poor father. He had been swallowed by a shark, poor man, while bathing off the coast of New Guinea, where the connection came in. She could not explain. Then they knocked up a little place for him at the bottom of the garden, about a quarter of a mile from the house, and made him take the machine down there when he wanted to work it. And sometimes a visitor would come to the house who knew nothing of the matter, and they would forget to tell him all about it and caution him, and he would go out for a stroll around the garden and suddenly get within earshot of those bagpipes without being prepared for it or knowing what it was. If he were strong, if he were a man of strong mind, it only gave him fits, but a person of mere average intellect, it usually sent mad. There is, it must be confessed, something very sad about the early efforts of an amateur in bagpipes. I have felt that myself when listening to my young friend. They appear to be a trying instrument to perform upon. You have to get enough breath for the whole tune before you start. At least so I gathered from watching Jefferson. He would begin magnificently with a wild, full, come to the battle sort of a note that quite roused you. But he would get more and more piano as he went on, and the last verse generally collapsed in the middle with a splutter and a hiss. You want to be in good health to play the bagpipes. Young Jefferson only learnt to play one tune on those bagpipes, but I never heard any complaints about the insufficiency of his repertoire, none whatever. This tune was, the Campbells are coming, hooray, hooray, so he said, though his father always held that it was the Bluebells of Scotland. 
Nobody seemed quite sure what it was exactly, but they all agreed it, that it sounded scotch. Strangers were allowed three guesses, and most of them guessed a different tune each time. Harris was disagreeable after supper. I think it must have been the stew that had upset him. He is not used to high living. So George and I left him in the boat and settled to go for a mooch round Henley. He said he should have, have he said he should have a glass of whiskey and a pipe and fix things up for the night. We were to shout when we returned, and he would row over from the island and fetch us. Don't go to sleep, old man, we said as we started. Not much fear of that while this stew's on, he grunted as he pulled back to the island. Hinley was getting ready for the regatta and was full of bustle. We met a goodish number of men we knew about the town, and in their pleasant company the time slipped by somewhat quickly, so that it was nearly eleven o'clock before we set off on our four-mile walk home, as we had learned to call our little craft by this time. It was a dismal night, coldish with a thin rain falling, and as we trudged through the dark, silent fields, talking low to each other and wondering if we were going right or not, we thought of the cozy boat with the bright light streaming through the tight-drawn canvas of Harris and Montmorency and the whiskey and wished that we were there. We conjured up the picture of ourselves inside, tired and a little hungry, of the gloomy river and the shapeless trees, and, like a giant glowworm underneath them, our dear old boat, so snug and warm and cheerful. We could see ourselves at supper there, pecking away at cold meat and passing each other chunks of bread. We could hear the cheery clatter of our knives, the laughing voices filling all the space and overflowing through the opening out into the night and we hurried on to realize the vision. We struck the towpath at length, and that made us happy, because prior to this we had not been sure whether we were walking towards the river or away from it, and when you are tired and want to go to bed, uncertainties like that worry you. We passed Ship Lake as the clock was striking the quarter to twelve, and then George said thoughtfully, You don't happen to remember which of the islands it was, do you? No, I replied, beginning to grow thoughtful, too. I don't. How many are there? Only four, answered George. It will be all right if he's awake. And if not, I queried. But we dismissed that train of thought. We shouted when we came opposite the first island, but there was no response. So we went to the second and tried there and obtained the same result. Oh, I remember now, said George. It was the third one. And we ran on hopefully to the third one and hallooed. No answer. The case was becoming serious. It was now past midnight. The boat hotels at Shiplake and Hinley would be crammed, and we could not go round knocking up cottagers and householders in the middle of the night to know if they let apartments. George suggested walking back to Henley and assaulting a policeman, and so getting a night's lodging in the station house. But then there was the thought, suppose he only hits us back and refuses to lock us up. We could not pass the whole night fighting policemen. Besides, we did not want to overdo the thing and get six months. We despairingly tried what seemed in the darkness to be the fourth island, but met with no better success. The rain was coming down fast now and evidently meant to last. We were wet to the skin and cold and miserable. We began to wonder whether there were only four islands or more, or whether we were near the islands at all, or whether we were anywhere within a mile of where we ought to be or in the wrong part of the river altogether. Everything looked so strange and different in the darkness. We began to understand the suffering of the babes in the wood. Just when we had given up all hope, Yes, I know that is always the time th that things do happen in novels and tales, but I can't help it. I resolved when I began to write this book that I would be strictly truthful in all things, and so I will be, even if I have to employ hackneyed phrases for the purpose. It was just when we had given up all hope, and I must therefore say so. Just when we had given up all hope, then, I suddenly caught sight of a little way below us, of a strange, weird sort of glimmer flickering among the trees on the opposite bank. For an instant I thought of ghosts. It was such a shadowy, mysterious light. The next moment it flashed across me that it was our boat, and I sent up such a yell across the water that made the night seem to shake in its bed. We waited breathless for a minute, and then, oh, divinest music of the darkness, we heard the answering bark of Montmorency. 
We shouted back loud enough to wake the seven sleepers. I never could understand myself why it should take more noise to wake seven sleepers than one. And after what seemed an hour, but was really, I suppose, about five minutes, we saw the lighted boat creeping slowly over the blackness and heard Harris's sleepy voice asking where we were. There was an uncountable strangeness about Harris. It was something more than mere ordinary tiredness. He pulled the boat against a part of the bank from which it was quite impossible for us to get into it and immediately went to sleep. It took us an immense amount of screaming and roaring to wake him up again and put some sense into him, but we succeeded at last and got safely on board. Harris had a sad expression on him, so we noticed when we got into the boat. He gave you the idea of a man who had been through trouble. We asked him if anything had happened, and he said, Swans! It seemed we had moored close to a swan's nest, and soon after George and I had gone, the female swan came back and kicked up a row about it. Harris had chivied her off, and she had gone away, and fit, fetched up to her old man. Harris said he had quite a fight with these two swans, but courage and skill had prevailed in the end, and he had defeated them. Half an hour afterwards, they returned with 18 other swans. It must have been a fearful battle, so far as we could understand Harris's account of it. The swans had tried to drag him and Montmorency out of the boat and drown them, and he had defended himself like a hero for four hours and had killed the lot, and they had all paddled away to die. How many swans did you say there were? asked George. Thirty-two, replied Harris sleepily. You said eighteen just now, said George. No, I didn't, grunted Harris. I said twelve. Think I can't count? What were the real facts about these swans we never found out? We questioned Harris on the subject in the morning, and he said, What swans? and seemed to think that George and I had been dreaming. Oh, how delightful it was to be safe in the boat after our trials and fears. We ate a hearty supper, George and I, and we should have had some toddy after it if we had, could have found the whiskey, but we could not. We examined Harris as to what he had done with it, but he did not seem to know what we meant by whiskey or what we were talking about at all. Montmorency looked as if he knew something, but said nothing. I slept well that night and should have slept better if it had not been for Harris. I have a vague recollection of having been woke up at least a dozen times during the night by Harris wandering about the boat with the lantern looking for his clothes. He seemed to be worrying about his clothes all night. Twice he routed up George and myself to see if we were lying on his trousers. George got quite wild the second time. What the thunder do you want your trousers for in the middle of the night? He asked indignantly. Why don't you lie down and go to sleep? I found him in trouble the next time I awoke because he could not find his socks. And my last hazy remembrance is of being rolled over on my side and of hearing Harris muttering something about its being an extraordinary thing where his umbrella could have got to.